Welcome, 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 everybody. So excited to have you here with us as we're letting people's audio get connected and their videos get connected and making sure everybody gets into the meeting. I thought you turned that off. It is turned off on my end. I don't know why it's still sounding. That's weird. Well, hello um, and welcome to Q&A with Pharmacist Ben and myself, Rebecca Kozak and John T. McCollier, who is our, our webmaster for the Critical Health News and many other websites within the Longevity family. I just want to say hello and welcome to everybody. We are so excited to be able to offer this resource to you. Um, for those of you who don't know, Pharmacist Bin has just this incredibly unique, relatable way of delivering information that is so easy to understand. And this show is put together so you can come on and learn, you can invite others to come on and hear the message of hope as well, because we're going to be sharing about health in general, um, how simple health is, and how we can do things on our own to be able to affect the way our futures, the future development of our cells um, improves. So with that, pharmacist Ben, Thank you so much for joining us. I know we've got a great topic. Uh, we've got some great questions that were e emailed in that we're going to be addressing. And I love the fact that, you know, you have time for us um, in your busy, busy schedule to provide this information and resource. So welcome pharmacist Ben Fuchs. Thank you. What's more important, Rebecca? Nothing. Of course I look, at, look at all these amazing people that are here with us today. I mean, we're, we are a family and there's nothing more important than family and health. Yeah. Yes, we are a family. You know, there's something about longevity, folks. We all want to help people. That's why we got into this business is to make a difference and to make money while we're doing it. And that's what, you, that's what makes longevity so awesome is that it's about financial health and it's about physical health. And it put, we put the two together. We get financially healthy by becoming physically healthy and by helping others become physically healthy. Absolutely. And, and I love the fact that, you know, when I started, I didn't know that there was a business opportunity and what the products did for me just lit this fire that whenever I found out that there was a business opportunity and I could refer people and actually get a thank you check, um, it was incredible because I was a stay-at-home mom. I mean, I had had a career that I absolutely loved, but, you know, I, I had a baby that was only a couple years old. I was in poor health. My health was coming back and I needed a way that I was able to make money, but still take care of my, my little guy. And longevity has just been a huge part of me being able to do that. And now, you know, the majority of the support that comes in for my family. What it's what fantastic. People, Rebecca, what do you say to people who can't make it go or who say, oh, it's just multi-level or network marketing and, oh, I can't sell. I'm not a salesperson. And, oh, I don't want to talk to my neighbors and my friends. They're going to blacklist me. And, oh, I don't want to be like Amway. You know, all the... All the negative stuff you hear about that, you're like living testimony to what's possible. What do you say to those folks? Yeah, so I, I've tried sales and I did not do well at sales. Um, um, but whenever I started feeling the product and I had that testimony that I could share with others, I wasn't sharing it trying to make a sell. I was sharing it because it was coming from my heart because I knew that I had something that would help them. And in the beginning, I was like so afraid to share the business. It was all about wanting to help people get better, wanting to help people get better. Well, guess what? There's a lot of people that want to get better in their finances. There's a lot of people that want to stay healthy and get better in their finances. So when it comes to, oh, is it direct sales? 
I'm like, you know what? Absolutely it is. We are providing something to you that is helping small business owners like myself all around the world without benefiting big business, the big boxes. So I love direct sales. I love network marketing. I mean, think about it. If you're involved in the school board, you've got a network that you're marketing with. It may not be about sales or a product, but your network and marketing your ideas and the way things should be run should happen. And, you know, you're, you're building the, the, a following per se. And when you're on, on Facebook, what are you doing? You're looking for people who have similar interests. You want to connect with people, whether it's in the future, people you've never met, people that you've known forever. You know, I've been reconnecting with people from high school asking me, you know, why don't you look any older? And I'm thinking, I look back at pictures then and I look, back, look at pictures now and I'm like, I look a whole lot better than I did then. <laughs> and and I, I love that and I'm able to share with them what I'm doing that has helped me get here. Which weight did you lose, Rebecca? Um, All together, I've lost um, 100 pounds. And I have to be honest, Ben, over Thanksgiving and Christmas, I did gain back a little bit of weight, like but I'm taking it back off. It doesn't look like you gained anything back. So, yeah, I did. But th the fact that I, that, you know, I've been able to maintain my supplements, I probably would gain a whole lot more if I would have stopped. You know, I love what you said about helping other people because that's really the, uh, what makes the longevity distributor successful. The successful distributors use longevity as a platform to help other people. And it doesn't have to be necessarily helping other people with their physical health or with supplements. It could be helping people with their financial health. It could be, it could be helping people understand how to build a business, how to enter into the world of small business, how to communicate on Facebook and using social media. So whatever your specialty is or whatever turns you on, if you can use that as a jumping off point or as a platform to help other people, you're going to be successful in the business. There's no getting around it. If you use longevity as a way to help people have better lives, like Zig Ziglar said, you can get every, everything you want if you help other people get what they want. If you use longevity in that way, there's no way that you're not going to be successful. Use it as a platform for you to express yourself, whatever your passion is, to make a difference in other people's lives. Well, and something that, uh, that I really appreciate, Ben, is, you know, when you get involved with the trainings that are going on with longevity, you're not just learning about product and sales. You're learning about yeah. self-development and improving yourself and your leadership skills. And, you know, whenever you work, and I know, if any of you have been in network marketing for any amount of time, you've heard work harder on yourself than you do your business and your business is going to fly. And that's what I have found. The more that I work on myself and my leadership skills, the more I have to offer to others, I know better how to support them, how to um, communicate. I mean, that, and that's a big thing communication skills are I've always been a communicator I mean that was my my thing in high school my thing through 4-H um, but now I'm able to use it on a much larger scale and and I appreciate that and you know everybody may not have aspirations like I do but wherever you are that's where you start and if you've never dreamed before dream and write it down. I've got my vision board. I've been checking things off my vision board. Um, and I, I think it's just absolutely fantastic. That hey, hey, Ben, I just want to jump in for a second here and, and mention that uh, Rebecca's going to be starting up a radio show soon. Yes, that's right. Maybe, uh, maybe she can have you on. I'd love to be on, on KSCO, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Oh, good job, Rebecca. 
I yes, I'm super excited about that. And Jaunty, I'm not finding you here so I can like add you to our there we are. Yeah, so things moved around. Hi, Dr. Judy. How are you? There we go. <laughs> There's Jaunty. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so I'm super excited. Better by the minute life with Becca. Um, and we're going to be talking about all things life and being empowered. So I'm super excited about that. And absolutely, Pharmacist Ben, I'm going to be inviting you on with me. And we're going to be talking about some topics that are important to not just us in longevity, but all together, you know, around the world, whether they know about longevity or not, whether they're in you know, in type, some type of health and wellness or not, it, it's on the forefront of people's minds right now. And that's something that I love the, that we're going to be able to use the radio platform to reach even more people. So thanks, Sean. Yeah, I wasn't going to mention that. Yeah, the market there, Rebecca. I know that's something I, I'm, you know, I'm really good about marketing other people and helping other people, you know, expand and market themselves. I got to learn to be better about myself, I guess. So thanks for the help, John. Um, so Ben, we've got a topic today okay. that is, of course, right there on the forefront of people's minds. You know, people are either for or against um, have, having a vaccination, a jab, whatever you want to call it, um, for things that are going on. And I know there's a lot of people that are for being able to maintain their jobs and stay employed and stay making money to support their family. They're having to get this vaccine. Um, whether it's willing or not, doesn't matter, but they're having to get this vaccine. And I have a lot of people asking, okay, what can I do now? I've had to get it. What can I do now to support my body? And, and I know you have a lot of insight as to what we can do nutritionally to support our bodies. There's a lot of things you could do, number one, to support your body after you get inoculated. To help, uh, and I'll talk about cleaning the blood here in a second because it's really a blood issue. And of course, there's lots of things you could do nutritionally to boost your immune system so that you could protect yourself. The, the inoculation doesn't protect you. People get sick, whether they're inoculated or not. People go to the hospital, whether they're inoculated or not. People die from uh, the uh, complications, as they say, of infection, whether they're inoculated or not. So being inoculated does not absolve you from having to take care of your immune system. And if you are inoculated, there are things you could do to help protect yourself from, uh, help protect yourself. I don't know about completely protect yourself because we don't really even know what's in the inoculation, which is kind of interesting. Anybody who tells you that you should have an inoculation should be asked if they know what's in the inoculation. We don't really know what's in it. So to be completely protected after you've been inoculated, you know, I don't know if that's gonna be possible, but there's certainly things you could do to mitigate the damage. Most of that involves the blood. Uh, contrary to popular belief, COVID is a blood infection. It's not a respiratory infection. Most people think it's a respiratory disease, a respiratory infection. It's not, it's a blood infection. In fact, uh, the, the respiratory system is dependent on the blood. And when the blood becomes coagulated and becomes toxic, the respiratory system is affected. And that's where the respiratory effects come from. The, the real issue with, with uh, the disease as well as with the inoculation is in the blood. In fact, the real issue with aging and disease in general involves the blood. And I've said many times, all disease is cell disease. All cell disease is preceded by dirty, toxic blood. So cleaning the blood, keeping the blood clean, keeping the blood fluid is all, uh, probably the num it's always important. It's probably the number one most important thing you can do to protect yourself from the effects of aging and from the effects of disease. As we age, as we get sicker, the blood becomes sticky and coagulated as a response to toxicity that gets into the blood. Usually that toxicity gets into the blood through the digestive system, through what's called a leaky gut. But if you inject things directly into the bloodstream through the skin, whether you're doing it uh, with, with recreational drugs or illegal drugs, or uh, whether you're doing it through medicine, through 
uh, inoculations that you get from the doctor or unfortunately inoculations that some people are mandated to take, you're going you're gonna to get the, the same kind of sticky and toxic and dirty blood that you would get if you had leaky gut syndrome. So for most people, leaky gut is where uh, dirty blood comes from. But these days, now we have to deal with inoculations causing dirty, toxic blood. Let me just digress real quickly. The blood is the sacred space. It's supposed to stay pure, purified. And it has an immune system of, it, of its own that protects it, protects it from toxicity. And when you think about it, the blood is distributing itself through all of the cells of the body. So if any toxicity gets into the blood, that's a serious situation. And the body has evolved a strategy, a mechanism for keeping the blood clean. That mechanism involves keeping uh, uh, surrounding toxicity, surrounding toxins, whether those toxins come in through the skin or whether they come in through the digestive system with immune cells. And these immune cells uh, create fibers and, and basically a pus-like situation in the bloodstream as a protective mechanism. If it happens once or twice, the body can handle it. But over the course of time, this uh, infectious material, this toxic material that's in the blood accumulates. And over the course of the months and the years and the decades, the blood starts to become coagulated and sticky and sludgy and doesn't circulate as well. When the blood doesn't circulate as well, it doesn't distribute nutrition as, as effectively. It doesn't distribute oxygen as effectively. It doesn't clean things out, detoxify the system as effectively. It doesn't electrify the, uh, the body as effectively. That's a very important role for the bloodstream. It creates an electrical charge as it's circulating. Basically, everything kind of pools up in the bloodstream. This can be, uh, this can be, uh, uh, the cause of things like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, organ dysfunction, cancer, pretty much all of the signs of aging and all of the diseases that we suffer from in a from a chronic long-term perspective are the end result of toxic, sticky, dirty blood. Good news is, well, the bad news is there's nothing doctors can do about this. There's no medical strategies for cleaning the blood. In fact, medical strategies tend to make the problem worse. The good news is, is we don't need medical strategies to clean the blood, we can do it ourselves. So whether you wanna clean the blood because you're post inoculation or whether you wanna clean the blood because you have leaky gut or whether you wanna clean the blood just because you wanna stay healthy and, and um, more beautiful for, for more of your life, there's lots of ways to do it. One of the most important things you could do is to make sure that you're drinking, a lot, uh, drinking enough water. Water hydrates the blood and almost immediately after you drink water, uh, that water gets, goes through your intestine and goes into the bloodstream. In fact, if you, you can notice this dramatically first thing in the morning, if you drink water, uh, if you drink cold water, especially because cold water tends to stimulate the body, warm water has a calming effect, cold water has a stimulating effect. If you drink four or five cold glasses of water right away first thing in the morning, you can feel a surge of energy. Some people will notice that they don't even need coffee just by simply drinking water. Water also di uh, dilutes blood sugar. One of the problems with elevated blood sugar is sugar is very sticky and coagulating and sugar can cause sticky, toxic blood. If you drink water after you ingest sugar, that can help dilute the blood and that can prevent some of the toxicity that's associated with excess sugar ingestion, which is an ideal strategy for folks who are diabetics or anybody who is uh, in, indulging in excess sugar, uh, drinking water immediately after you, uh, after you ingest sugar can help dilute the blood. Essential fatty acids are probably, well, they're probably the most important nutritional supplement that you can take for keeping the blood clean. And the ultimate EFAs are a absolute must have for anybody who's worried about, worried about sticky, sticky toxic blood, especially after, you, uh, after you've been inoculated. Uh, using the essential fatty acids, I recommend a lot of them, 12 to 15 of them a day, uh, but at least three to six, at least six to nine a day. Three, a lot of people are taking three a day. That's really not going to have a, a great effect on thinning the blood. It's not even going to have a great uh, EFA effect. You really want six to nine, ideally 12 to 15, especially if you're post-inoculation. Vitamin E always goes with uh, essential fatty acids. You'll notice that there's vitamin E in the ultimate EFAs. Vitamin E also has a blood thinning effect. In fact, doctors will tell you uh, after you have surgery not to take vitamin E because they're thinking, well, it's gonna thin the blood. Interestingly, after you have surgery, the blood tends to clot. That's why they give you blood thinners after surgery. Uh, a lot of people go home with heparin or get immediately put on heparin after surgery. Surgery uh, is another, uh, another uh, way that the blood will clot as a manifestation of the stress response. And I forgot to mention that, the stress response also has a blood clotting effect. 
So if you're under a lot of duress, under a lot of psychological stress or physiologic stress, that can also have a blood clotting effect. So anyway, vitamin E has a blood thinning effect. Uh, you'll find vitamin E in the uh, Beyond Tangy Tangerine as well as in the Ultimate EFAs. Uh, there's a couple other products with vitamin E. Rebecca, feel free to jump in if you if you know of any uh, Yongevity products that have any of the supplements, any of the nutrients that I'm talking about. Yeah, so uh, the um, Prohoba Omega also has vitamin E in it also. Yeah, vitamin E is really a really wonderful underappreciated vitamin for not just for the blood, but for the liver, for the brain, and most especially for the heart. High doses of vitamin E are wonderful for the skin. In fact, vitamin E is very sun protective for the skin. So if you're one of those folks who's who finds that you're out, uh, that you sunburn, that you sunburn readily when you're out in the sun, vitamin E can be a great anti-sunburn strategy. And then we come to one of the all-time great longevity supplements, which is the Fucoid Z. In fact, uh, Fucoid Z is, is Fucoidin, uh, which is an active ingredient in a uh, type of seaweed, brown seaweed. It's uh, brown seaweed. Uh, there's three different kinds of seaweed. There's brown seaweed, there's red seaweed, and there's green seaweed. Brown seaweed uh, is a source of fucoidin, which is not really found very in very many places. In fact, I don't know of any places where fucoidin is found aside from seaweed. Fucoidin is a remarkably valuable immune boosting supplement. And if you do a Google search or a PubMed search, pubmed.com or scholar.google.com are two great websites, two great uh, websites that have wonderful uh, uh, academic information, not commercial information, but academic research. Uh, academic information that doesn't have advertising and it's scholar.google.com and pubmed.com. If you do a search on either of those sites, you'll find Eucoidin, uh, hundreds of studies on Eucoidin for cancer and for boosting the immune system. And that's really its claim to fame. But Eucoidin uh, also has a wonderful blood thinning effect. And by virtue of its blood thinning effect, it can improve all kinds of cardiovascular conditions, heart health conditions, hypertension conditions, as well as helping support the action uh, or helping counteract the actions of dirty blood. So after you've been inoculated, get yourself on the Fucoid Z if you're not already on the Fucoid Z. By the way, I was just reading about seaweed being used to treat and to prevent COVID infections, which is not a surprise to me because I've been talking about seaweed for a long time as a powerful immune booster. And in fact, in the future, seaweed is going to be an important food source being abundant as well as cheap. In fact, it may be the most abundant food source on the planet. The largest animals in the world subsist on seaweed, which is a source of B vitamins, amino acids, vitamin, uh, iron, minerals, electrical minerals, plant-derived minerals, for example. It's no accident that the, uh, uh, the most abundant life forms live in the ocean. And anybody who's scuba dived has been blown away by all the different forms of life that are in the ocean. And the reason that the ocean is so filled with life is because the water is like an electrical soup. And that electrical soup is, that electricity in the electrical soup is driven by minerals, which are absorbed by seaweeds. And when you eat those seaweeds, you're eating these electrical minerals. They're very similar to Yongevity plant-derived minerals, the minerals that are found in seaweed. There's also substances called polysaccharides, long chains of sugar, uh, that are found in seaweeds that are important for building the immune system and building connective tissue and important for the circulatory system. So you have omega-3 omega, uh, omega and 6 essential fatty acids, which are important for thinning the blood post-inoculation. That's the ultimate EFAs. You have vitamin E, which is important for thinning the blood uh, post-inoculation. You have fucoidin, which is also important for thinning the blood post-inoculation. Then there's another strategy for cleaning out the blood, and that's called chelation. C-H-E-L-A-T-I-O-N. Some of you guys may have heard of chelation therapy. Chelation therapy is when you'll go to a chiropractor or a naturopath or perhaps a doctor who is, uh, who is open-minded and they'll actually inject a chelation ingredient into your bloodstream, typically something called EDTA. And this EDTA or this uh, chelation substance is like a magnet that attracts toxicity and pulls it out of the blood. That's called chelation therapy. And it can be done intravenously in a healthcare professional, a healthcare practitioner's office. But there's also nutritional supplements that act like chelating agents that have this ability to magnetically attract toxins and pull them out of the bloodstream. Uh, and this is an important, this can be an important strategy for general blood detoxification, for protecting yourself from infections and from, uh, from viral infections or microbial infections, and also for post inoculation. One of the best chelating agents is selenium. And the ultimate selenium is not only 
uh, important for the thyroid and important for eye health and important for the immune system. It's also a wonderful chelating agent. And post inoculation, you definitely want to be on the ultimate selenium, probably 400 to 600 micrograms a day. Selenium is one of those uh, nutrients that's hard to find in food, by the way. Uh, shellfish, seafood, uh, Brazil nuts, grains, those are, those are typically good sources of uh, selenium. But these days with soil depletion, it's very difficult to get selenium from your veggies or from grains. Did you want to say something, Rebecca? Yeah, before we get too far away from Z radical and Pucoid Z and, and the seaweed and, and those electrifying minerals, we also have the ocean's gold that takes, takes the same type from a different ocean. So you're getting kind of multiple worlds of undersea um, nutrients in the ocean's gold and combining it with the, the Z radical or the Fucoidin um, products. So I wanted to make sure that we didn't forget about that one either, because that's, that's an incredible one. I take daily. The ocean's gold. Yes. Yeah. And the Fucoid Z. Okay, so, and the Fucoid Z. I, I love the Fucoid Z. By the way, Z radical is the liquid form of Fucoid Z. A lot of people take the Z radical, which tastes really good. Um, and it's a good source of fucoidin, but the fucoid Z, in my, from, from my money, the fucoid Z, you get more bang for your buck. It's, it's not as tasty, obviously, it's a capsule, but it, you get more activity out of the fucoid Z, so it's more, it's more cost effective. The, uh, the Z radical is more for kids, it has a nicer taste to it, and it's still a good source of fucoidin, but the fucoid Z, you get a much denser concentration of the active ingredient. So you have the ultimate selenium for chelating. Also, another great chelating agent is sulfur. And there's a couple of different ways you can get sulfur in longevity products. One is MSM, which you'll find in a, a few of the longevity products, it's most notably the Beyond Tangy Tangerine. And by the way, the Beyond Tangy Tangerine have got quite a few chelating agents and immune boosting, uh, immune boosting components. So uh, while we don't often think of um, the Beyond Tangy Tangerine as an immune boosting supplement, it most certainly is. And if you're not gonna do anything else, uh, and you want to protect yourself from infection, viral infection, or you want to protect yourself from untoward effects post inoculation, the Beyond Tangy Tangerine is awesome. Beyond Tangy Tangerine is also a source of MSM, uh, methyl sulfonyl methane, technically, and it's a source of sulfur. It's uh, a very clean source of sulfur. You can't overdose on MSM. It's one of those supplements you can take as much of it as, as you want. Um, and MSM, by virtue of the sulfur it contains, is a great chelating agent. There's also another supplement that some of you guys may have heard of. Uh, the, it's been in the news lately, it's called N-acetylcysteine or NAC. I've been talking about NAC for many, many years. When I first discovered the importance of NAC for helping uh, heal the skin for folks who had acne, NAC is also protective against some of the uh, untoward effects associated with acne remedies like benzoyl peroxide and Retin-A. NAC is so multifunctional, it's also been used to treat things like addictive disorders, social anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, that's psychological benefits in addition to having physiologic benefits. And as far as physiology goes, as far as detoxification goes, NAC is so powerful as a detoxifying supplement that it's actually kept in emergency rooms and injected right into people's bloodstream when they have uh, Tylenol or aspirin overdoses. They'll give you NAC right into your blood as a detoxifying or as a liver, liver cleansing agent. Of course, we could all use liver cleansing agents these days if we're drinking the water, breathing the air, eating fish and eating dairy and meat and eating processed foods, liver detoxification is an important strategy. And NAC is probably the most important liver detox supplement. Also, if you're on prescription drugs, not just if you're uh, worried about side effects from inoculations, if you're taking prescription drugs, you should know that your body has to detoxify those prescription drugs. Prescription drugs are not used by the body. Medications are not used by the body. Medications have an effect on cells, but cells want to get rid of medications as quickly as possible. And the liver is the main organ of detoxification of prescription drugs. So for anybody who's taking prescription drugs, especially if you're taking a lot of prescription drugs, and uh, according to uh, statistics, uh, everybody over the age, every American over the age of 60 or the average American over the age of 60 is on three or more prescription drugs. And acetylcysteine is an incredibly valuable liver detox nutrient. It's also an important chelating agent by virtue of the sulfur that it contains. Um, there are a couple of longevity products. Rebecca, help me out. There's a couple of longevity products that have N-acetylcysteine in them. Um, and yes, so our daily digest packs, yes. those are incredible. They have 
have an acetylcysteine and also our ultra body toddy has it in there. Um, and I know we have some amazing health coaches on here that if you want to put anything in the comments as to what else has an acetylcysteine um, and help us out, that would be fabulous. Okay. Um, one of the most underappreciated chelating agents is also a powerful immune boosting agent. In fact, it may be the most important of all the vitamins and that's vitamin C. People don't recognize that vitamin C has chelating properties, has blood cleaning properties. And on top of that, it has immune boosting properties. And like MSM and like a lot of nutritional supplements, you can't really overdose on vitamin C. People have taken grams of it, in, have actually injected grams of it right into their bloodstream. And in fact, injecting vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C is a great health strategy for folks who have cancer or folks who are dealing with immune problems or people who are um, just interested in anti-aging. But you can take vitamin C orally, you get wonderful benefits from it. There's a lot of longevity products that have vitamin C in it, including the Beyond Tangy Tangerine. Uh, and vitamin C not only is important as a chelating agent, it's also an immune boosting supplement. The more toxicity your body's subjected to, and that includes sugar, the more deficient you're going to be in vitamin C because vitamin C is used by the body to purify itself from sugar and other toxicity. And that's especially true about cigarette smoke. For folks who are smoking, uh, every time you smoke a cigarette, you're losing up to 25 milligrams of vitamin C to help detoxify, to help uh, detoxify the toxins that are in cigarette smoke. So for folks who are smoking, after you smoke, uh, take some Beyond Tangy Tangerine. Don't just drink Beyond Tangy Tangerine, but swish it around your mouth, gargle it in your uh, gargle with it, so that you can detoxify some of the effects of cigarette smoke. That uh, some of the toxic effects that are uh, caused by cigarette smoke directly on the mucosa or the skin inside your throat and inside your mouth. So gargling with Beyond Tangy Tangerine and then taking Beyond Tangy Tangerine is a great uh, detoxification strategy. Also a great way to chelate. Uh, toxins that are in the blood and also a great way to boost the immune system. Did you want to say something, Rebecca? Actually, Ben, if, if I could, there was something I wanted to share. Um, you know, as we talk about being one family, if, uh, if I was talking to a member of my family about getting vaccinated, I, w I would, uh, among many other things, uh, I, I would want to share this with them. Uh, there was a a little bit of a, a, I'm going to share my screen here, so maybe I can have you all sort of see what I'm seeing. Um, there was a study done in uh, August of uh, 2001 um, <clears throat> called Intravenous Injection of Coronavirus Disease 2019 mRNA Vaccine Can Induce Acute Myopericarditis in Mouse Model. Uh, you can see there's actually quite a few folks who've got their name on this one. It's not necessarily a very small study. And what they did is they um, they took 35 mice and injected them with saline, and they took 35 mice and injected them with a version of the mRNA vaccine. Um, and oh, sorry, I didn't get it quite right. Um, they they injected uh, uh, one group. Um, there were four groups: uh, the saline group, and then in in the uh, in the test group they injected half of them intramuscularly and the other half um, intravenously. So when a person, when a person gets, um, when a person gets one of the, the vaccines, you get it in your muscles. And it's actually rather important that you get it in your muscles. And I'll show you why in just a second. The, the mice that were injected intravenously into their veins, um, well, I, I think you can see the results here. Uh, what we have is, um, no is we have a, a, a healthy mouse heart over here that is in, it, um, intramuscularly injected. And then we have uh, the intravenously injected mouse here. And, and you, what you can see is an, an awful lot of, of inflammation. Go ahead and do a screen share again, buddy. Oh, I forgot to do that. <laughs> okay, here we go. So if you look at the one in the middle, um, you can probably see that it's... Uh, uh, very inflamed. It's all covered with this white stuff. Uh, so, so all the, all the mice that um, all the mice that were injected intravenously died. Uh, the ones that were injected intramuscularly lived. Uh, what uh, the 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 group of humans most likely to experience myocarditis are young, healthy men. And just to use common sense young healthy men have in common very good um, circulation in their muscles 
Uh, another aspect of it is that um, traditionally nurses, when giving an injection, will slightly pull back on the syringe to see if a little squirt of blood comes into the syringe. It's called intubating. Intubating? In in oh no, I got the word wrong now. Um, in uh, Ben, do you know this? I don't know what you're um, saying. Where are you saying? I'm not sure what you're saying about the intramuscular versus intravenous. Yeah, the muscle is going to get into the blood eventually. Exactly. Basically, uh, just quickly, and I'm from animal science, and I've done a lot of this. Whenever you do an injection, you need to pull back, and I can't think of the term right now either. I'll think of it. But you pull back to to make sure you're not in a blood vessel, so that you want that injection to go into the muscle if you're doing an IM injection, right, intermuscular. So you pull back, and if there's no blood, you go ahead and inject. And if it's a long, it's a big injection like we do for horses, you might even pull back more than once because the needle can move. Because the idea is you don't, in an IM injection, you don't want to go directly into the blood. There's other injections that are IV that on purpose, we would find a huge jugular vein, inject, I did racehorses, and you would inject straight into the blood. Um, and what I was doing is drawing blood. So I would have to, you know, put some saline in, draw blood, then put saline back. But the point being, the difference between going into the muscle and going into the blood is time. It's how long does it take for that to be effective? And if it's an injection meant for IM, you don't want it in directly in the blood. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Judy. And and if uh, if we look at the nature of the mRNA vaccines, what's going on here is that the uh, uh, to put it in the, the most layman terms I possibly can, the vaccine finds some of your cells and then inserts a little bit of, uh, of RNA into them so that they start producing spike proteins. Uh, those spike proteins then piss off your immune system, so your immune system learns how to fight spike proteins. Um, if your immune system is fighting spike proteins in your arm, then you're going to have a bit of a sore arm. If your immune system is fighting spike proteins in your heart, uh, you're going to end up with uh, with an, with inflammation or a variety of other uh, ne nefarious issues. At least that's my that's my understanding of the situation. So, um, oh, I can't believe I forgot the term. In in I'm going to look it up right now. Um, but uh, it's it's something you can actually ask. Uh, the, the there was some guidance that said you don't necessarily need to do this with these vaccines, which I don't even understand. Uh, if, but there's a lot of information on this. Uh, Dr. John Campbell spoke on this quite a bit. Uh, he's a, a, a person with a lot of authority on the topic on, on YouTube. Um, uh, I'll, go I'll go look for the, for the term. But yeah, Ben, what do you think about this idea of something that if it goes right into your veins, it's, it's, if it goes right into a mouse's veins, I should say, it kills the mouse. Um, but, uh, you know, don't worry, we're injecting it into your muscle. Oh, well, Dr. Judy said it very well. The only difference is time. Eventually, everything's getting into the blood. So we're talking about cleaning the blood, whether it's IM or IV. Yes, you're right. These are IM. It's like what it actually acts like is like a sustained release delivery system into the bloodstream. The whole point of, of injecting yourself, IM or IV for that matter, is that you want the stuff in the bloodstream. You don't want it in the muscle. You want it in the bloodstream so it gets distributed to all the cells. But the muscle acts as a kind of buffer to keep the, keep the toxin from being deposited directly into the bloodstream. Nonetheless, you still want to be cleaning the blood. That's your strategy, is to keep, keep the blood clean, whether you're talking about leaky gut or whether you're talking about inoculations, IM or IV. You want to be cleaning the blood, and that's where, where these chelation strategies become valuable, as well as these uh, blood fluidity strategies. Oh, I just remembered the, the, the term. It's called aspirate. Uh -huh. Okay. So you can, if if you're getting a vaccine, I, I would, this is what I would do. I would say to the nurse, do you aspirate? And if they say something like, no, you can ask them to, <laughs> or decide you want to see a different nurse. Even if they aspirate, the point is it's going to get in the blood eventually. So whether you're taught, the whole point is to get it into the blood, albeit a little bit slower if it's IM than it's IV, but the whole point of the inoculation is to get it into the blood so it can get distributed through all the, to this, all of the cells in the body. So in any case, um, 
Fluid, fluidizing the blood is strategy number one. Chelating the blood is strategy number two. And then building the immune system is also important. And there's lots of ways you could do that. We talked about vitamin C for building the immune system. Uh, also selenium early, uh, is important in addition to being a chelating agent for building the immune system. Zinc is probably the most important mineral for building the immune system. For a long time, you couldn't even get zinc. Um, there's zinc in the Longevity Zinc FX. Uh, there's, I think there's some in the, uh, there's definitely some in the Beyond Tangy Tangerine. There's plant-derived zinc and in the, in the uh, mineral drink, there's also uh, plant-derived zinc. What other products have zinc in there? Help me out, uh, Rebecca. Um, the Immune FX is really good. The Ultimate Zinc, which is a liquid, has zinc in it as well, plus other stuff. Um, I think right now what I'm finding my, my favorites are the Ultimate Zinc, which is a liquid, and you do the dropper fulls, and also the Immune FX, which is, if you haven't tried the Immune FX, folks, and you remember those Orange Julius drinks with the pineapple, mm, really good, really good. Uh, and then also uh, protein. Whey protein is especially building for the immune system. Whey protein, not everybody can do whey protein. If you can't do whey protein, it's unfortunate because it is probably the best supplemental protein powder that you can get, especially when it comes to building the immune system. There's factors that are passed from the mama cow to the baby cow that are designed to build the immune system. And those factors are found in whey protein. Uh, so whey protein is a, also a valuable immune booster in addition to vitamin C and selenium. So fluidizing the blood, strategy number one, chelating the blood, strategy number two, and then building the immune system, strategy number three, for folks who are, number, who are worried about getting infected in the first place or who have been inoculated and want to protect themselves from untoward effects. Becca? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Dr. Judy. Okay, there's one other way to tie all this together about the, the myocarditis and the heart problems. We all know that Dr. Wallach um, did, did all the work on lack of selenium causing problems, the Kishan disease in China and all these different things. And so if you're looking at the young males who get the inoculation and then end up with a myocarditis or something like that, what, what I'm kind of thinking is that one of the things, because of all the exercise they're doing, remember the more exercise we do, the more nutrients we need. So these young athletes are doing a lot of exercise. They may not be supplementing. They may not have a, enough selenium. And when you're ill, you need more selenium. So basically we're compounding an athlete, less selenium, um, an injury or an infection, less selenium. And we're getting a result, which is basically the same as a selenium deficiency causing certain heart things. Now I know there are studies out there where they're showing specific effects of the spike protein in the heart. And I have no, I mean, I'm not disputing any of that. I'm just saying, I think one of the first things I thought of when I started hearing about the myocarditis was, you know, look at your selenium, look at your deficiency, and then also your vitamin C. We've talked a lot on Becca's program about it's the first vitamin we started talking about was vitamin C because you need it all the time, every day, everywhere. We can't make it. And when the animals make it, they, the sicker they are, the more they make. So they study animals and they say, well, wow, if a goat is sick, it'll make, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but maybe a thousand times more vitamin C. Well, it's sick and then it goes back to normal. Well, since we can't regulate that at all, we have to do it ourselves. We have to realize that you know, we may be vitamin C deficient. So one of the things they've done is with sick people who have all kinds of infections, including COVID, if you look at their vitamin C, they're extremely low. And that's why one of the first therapies was IV vitamin C, trying to get that back. And vitamin D is another one. If you look, there was research two years ago, I was just looking it up because someone asked me, and I started sending things out to people about two years ago about vitamin D immediately. They, they, had three tiers of if you were sick with COVID and they looked at your blood, the amount of sickness you had was directly related to the amount of vitamin D you had in your blood. So again, the, there are nutrients here that when you get sick, you deplete them and there's gotta be a way to put them, to put them back in. So you for whatever, three, you know. Three great points that Dr. Judy just raised. Selenium is very important for the heart above and beyond the fact that it's a chelating agent. And myocarditis is very similar to Keyshawn's disease, at least functionally, 
Uh, and it could very well be that selenium deficiency is involved. Judy also raised another good point and said that athletes are tend to be, unless, unless they're supplementing, unless they're hip to nutrition and professional athletes tend to be, but if you're a weekend warrior or kids who are athletes, they don't always realize that sometimes if you're an athlete or you're running or you're taking care of your body by exercise and you're going to the gym and you're not supplementing and you're not taking care of your nutrition, you may be better off sitting on the couch eating bonbons all day. In other words, putting stress on the body sometimes is, being per is perceived as a good thing, but if you're nutritionally deficient, you can actually cause problems. Also, Judy said another really important thing, and that is that vitamin C isn't uh, animals will make more vitamin C when they're sick. I want to add to that that animals will also make more vitamin C when they're under stress. So it's not just it's not just full blown disease, but even just duress of being in a pen or being cooped uh, uh, it, for a cow being tied up to a a milking machine, whatever kind of stress an animal is undergoing, they will actually make more vitamin C under stress. So when you're sick or when you're under stress, you need extra vitamin C. So those are two great points that. That Judy raised. You said something. Oh, vitamin D. That's another thing that Judy said. Yeah, vitamin D is super important. Vitamin D is our summertime vitamin, and it's tied into exposure to the sun. That's because during the summertime, from an evolutionary perspective, that's when human beings would get most injured. And so, vitamin D helps up upregulate the body's ability to handle injuries and to handle disease. So, vitamin D is very important for the immune system, and that tells you that getting yourself out in the sun is really important for building the immune system, which is kind of ironic considering under conditions of viral infection, people stay in, tend to stay inside uh, and tend to avoid the sun, which is just another example of how counterproductive some of our normal health strategies or our, our conventional health strategies can be. Uh, I wanna add one thing about, key, about blood thinning that I forgot to mention, uh, and that is the glucogel caps are also wonderful blood thinning agents. Glucosamine has a blood thinning effect via, uh, via its electronics. And so using the glucogel caps, even though most people know about the glucogel caps for arthritis, we don't tend to think of it as being important for the circulatory system. And in the case of sticky blood that can follow either viral infection or inoculation, using the glucogel caps can help protect you from uh, some of the untoward effects associated with both inoculation and viral infection. So I, I just wanted to add that. I forgot to mention that when we talked about blood thinning. That's awesome. I mean, this is, we've had a lot of information, folks, that have been that's been shared just now. If you have questions, go ahead and raise your hand, and especially if there are questions about what we have just been speaking about. Let me so, add one more thing. Uh, Rebecca, if it's okay, one more thing. Uh, absolutely. Great supplement that doesn't get recognized as a blood thinning or blood cleaning supplement are the ultimate enzymes. Digestive enzymes have a what's called a proteolytic effect. That means they dissolve protein. And when you take them oral, you take them after meals, they'll help dissolve protein in your meals. But if you take them on an empty stomach, they can help dissolve protein clots in the blood. And they can have a blood thinning effect that can be beneficial for, for people who are dealing with blood clotting problems or circulatory problems, but also post inoculation and to prevent some of the effects, some of the uh, toxicity associated with viral infection. So the glu glucogel caps and the ultimate enzymes are not marketed directly as circulatory improving supplement, circulatory system improving supplements, but uh, by virtue of the proteolytic effects, protein dissolving effects of the enzymes and the electrical charges that are associated with the glucogel, uh, you get blood thinning effects from both of these supplements, even though they're not marketed as such. So um, Debbie, one of somebody here on with us today, um, she has asked the question, can collagen help too? Now I know in glucogel, you know, that's, that's considered collagen. Collagen can definitely help. The collagen peptides can help. Absolutely. Uh, and foods that tend to contain collagen also have immune boosting properties. So collagen directly has some blood thinning effects. It's a hydrating, it has a hydrating property. That's why collagen is used in skincare because it attracts moisture. And that same moisture attracting property can help improve blood supply or blood flow. Uh, and then also collagen is important for the vascular system. The heart depends on collagen. The heart actually sits on a skeleton of collagen and as collagen deteriorates, electrical charges change in the heart. And that can uh, be one of the causes of atrial fibrillation and tachycardias and various arrhythmias. And also collagen is important for the strength and integrity of the blood vessels. So uh, building strong blood vessels, building a healthy heart, as well as hydrating the blood 
can be accomplished with collagen. Uh, and also the foods that contain collagen, i.e. bone broth, especially bone broth, also have immune boosting factors in them as well. So collagen peptides are using bone broth, bone broth protein, um, making your own bone soup, that kind of thing. All of those are great ways to boost collagen and boost your immune system and get multiple benefits. In fact, taking collagen or using collagen and collagen building blocks, the peptides, hyaluronic acid, things that help you build collagen and vitamin C, which is critical for helping you build collagen are also not only great for the blood and great for the heart, they're just great anti-aging strategies. In fact, many of the signs of aging from the arthritis to the osteoporosis to the heart disease are uh, to the stooped over appearance that people get as they get older are signs of collagen deficiency and collagen breakdown. So you'll get anti-aging benefits, whether you're talking about structural or appearance benefits by using collagen and collagen building supplements. Now, Brenda Teresa has a question and she wants to know, is the liquid glucogel just as effective as the capsules? It's just as effective, but you don't get as much glucosamine. You get more glucosamine in the capsule than you do in the liquid. So it is just as effective. And in fact, it may be more effective in the sense that it's easier for the body to absorb, but you get more glucosamine in the capsules than you, than you do in the, uh, in the liquid, unless you drink a lot of the liquid, of course. But the, you get, it's more val you, uh, there's more value to the capsules than there is to the liquid. Uh, it's more cost effective is what I want to say. Uh, the capsules are more cost effective because you get more glucosamine per dose, uh, per bottle than you do in a bottle of the, of the liquid. Okay, and Gary has a question. If you donate blood a few times a year, does that clean out your kidneys, liver, and blood? Absolutely, it does. Absolutely, it does. Because when you give blood, you're giving your old blood away and your body's making new blood. So yes, you are, you're, that's a great blood cleaning strategy. In fact, um, there's certain heavy metals, uh, not heavy metals, but nutritional metals like iron uh, that can, when the levels are high in the blood, that can cause a problem. And by giving blood, you're actually, uh, you actually lose excess iron. So uh, giving blood is a, definitely a good strategy. And it and helps. Since we're, on, since we're on the blood thing, I, 30 years, no joke, 30 years I tried to give blood and they kept re rejecting me because I was too anemic. And after being on the Longevity products, um, it was just over a year. I had somebody call me up. I moved to a new town. The mayor called, says, hey, Becca, you want to give blood? I'm like, sure, why not? Totally not expecting to be able to give blood. They tested my blood and asked if I would sit for a double setting a full red blood, red blood um, donation. I can't remember the exact term. And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, your blood is amazing. And I'm like, yes. So I've been able to give blood now every six months, Monday, I'm doing it again. Um, and that's just something that nutrition has, has offered me uh, just you know, without me even trying to work on my blood. It's just, I gave my body what it needed. My bones got stronger. My blood got stronger. And I love the side effect. Rebecca, your blood, and for everybody listening, your blood is liquid bone. It's liquid connective tissue. So the blood is actually considered to be a tissue of the body. So just like you build bone or you build other tissues in the body when you, uh, when you, uh, when you supplement, when you take care of your nutritional supplementation, you build blood as well. It's important to think of blood that way. I didn't mean, you know, I said it's liquid bone. It's not exactly like, like liquid bone, but it's liquid connected tissue. And that's important to recognize that just like you build all the tissues of the body, you will build your blood when you supplement, when you use nutritional supplements and given all the roles, all the important roles that the blood plays in, in oxygenation and nutrition and detoxification and electrification. That's just another wonderful benefit that you get from nutritional supplementation. Yeah, I, I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Now, now, going back to the glucogels and Brenda Teresa brought up a really good point. The glucogel capsules, the, one of the good, big differences between glucogel capsules and the liquid is the liquid does not include any shellfish. So if you have an issue, a sensitivity or an, a, an allergic reaction to shellfish, the liquid glucogel would be the way you want to go. And that's a good point because shellfish is a great way to get glucosamine. 
if you want to if you want to boost your glucosamine levels from uh, from from your diet, shellfish. In fact, taking shrimp shells and most of us throw out those shrimp shells. If you save your shrimp shells, shrimp shells, and uh, use them in soup, and use them to flavor seafood soup or bone soup, you'll get great glucosamine. You'll get great hyaluronic acid, wonderful bone building and blood building, and and uh, immune boosting nutrients in the shrimp shells or from the shrimp shells. I did not know that. I always put them right into my compost. Yeah, so you know, I I work them in there, but that's that's good to know. So like bone broth and you your bone broth absolutely. Save your shrimp shells, put them in the freezer, and then uh, when you make your bone broth toss or any soup for that matter, toss them in there. Filter them out before you eat them because they're kind of crunchy. They're they're not bad, but uh, they're crunchy. By the way, glucosamine is not really found in a lot of foods. Shrimp shells are one of the few uh, shells of shrimp and also insects, um, which shrimp are very similar to, and uh, lobster and crabs are one of the few places that you can find glucosamine in foods. Okay, but for those who aren't able to, to eat shellfish, what are some foods that have glucosamine in them? In insects. Insects? Hey. I heard chocolate covered be beetles are really good. Future insects. In third world countries, insects are very popular. In fact, I was reading a book called um, the, Omnim uh, the Omnivore's Choice. Now, it wasn't the Omnivore's Develop uh, Dilemma. It's called The Omnivore's Choice, I believe. And in it, the author hypothesizes that the reason we like crunchy foods is because our uh, ancient ancestors, many millions of years ago, were insectivores. Uh, that is, they ate insects. And that the author hypothesizes, he's a uh, evolutionary biologist, and he says that it's very likely that our, our fondness for crunchy foods, which is so well known among uh, food processors that they'll actually put a, a crunch enhancing substances in their cereals and in their chips, uh, comes from the fact that we used, to, we used to eat a lot of insects. So while insects may not sound like they're very attractive, and our, our evolutionary past says that we ate insects, and our evolutionary future may be to continue eating insects because they're a great source of fats and a great source of protein. And they're also a source of glucosamine. Glucosamine is found in, these, in the shells of these foods, uh, in the shells of these uh, creatures. Uh, so it's very hard to find glucosamine from foods. There's a derivative of glucosamine that's called N-acetyl glucosamine or NAG, N-A-G, which you may have heard of. A NAG is found in uh, succulents like noni. The noni juice from longevity has, has uh, NAG in it. Aloe vera has NAG in it. And NAG is not exactly like glucosamine. It's a derivative of glucosamine. It has its own benefits for help building uh, the, uh, the lining of the intestine. And that's one of the reasons why aloe vera and noni for that matter and other succulents are recommended for folks who have irritable bowel syndrome or, or Crohn's disease or any, uh, any uh, uh, intestinal health issues. So a NAG is found in foods. Glucosamine is not really found in a lot of foods aside from, aside from uh, shellfish. Good to know. Let's go to a hand that is up, and we have Mike. Mike, go ahead and unmute yourself. You're on hey, live. Hi, hey, Mike. Hi, Mike. Hey, Mike. I can't really hear Mike, then. Mike, I can't yeah. hear. That was great. There's one question I have about the blood thing. I'm having a Mike. Huh? Mike, where's your, where's your microphone at, buddy? Can you get closer to it? Oh yeah, I can. Okay, that's a little better. Much yeah. better. One question I have about the, the, all the blood stuff is excellent. You keep bringing something out called leaky gut. You can't hear me. No, I, so I he hear has a question about leaky gut. Yeah. What? How do you know if you have leaky gut? Great and, question. Great question. I love that question. Let me tell you, there is a test that you can, uh, that they'll do for you in the doctor's office or at a chiropractor's office where they'll give you the sugar drink and then they'll analyze, they'll compare the amount of sugar that's released in your stool from the amount of sugar that you drank. And based on the, the proportion of sugar that's released out of your body to the proportion that's, that you drank, they'll determine whether or not you have leaky gut. You don't need to have a test done. If you're sick in any chronic way, assume you have leaky gut and start doing strategies to patch up the gut. There's many of those strategies. I can tell you what those are here in a second, but don't worry about diagnosis. Don't worry about tests. The reason that's such an important question is we always wanna get tested to be sure. It's like these COVID tests that people are doing. 
They want to line up to make sure they have, they have, whether they have COVID or not. If you're sick, you're sick. It doesn't matter whether you call it COVID or you call it any other viral infection. You don't need to be tested. Likewise with leaky gut, if you have a chronic disease, rest assured you have leaky gut and start treating yourself as if you did. To, to know officially that, that, you know, have a doctor proclaim you with leaky gut, like he's, like he's knighting you, you have leaky gut, Mike, is really not right. it's important. It's just, it's kind of a diversion. It's a red herring. Just assume that you have leaky gut if you're sick and start treating yourself accordingly. The best way to treat leaky gut is number one, avoid foods that inflame the intestine. The most common foods that inflame the intestine are processed and fried fats. And it's no accident right. that we figured out how to process and fry fats at the turn of the 20th century. That's when Americans' health started to decline precipitously. precipitously. So avoiding those kinds of foods, fried fats, like the plague, is your best strategy for preventing leaky gut as well as reversing leaky gut if you already have it. Um, it's, it's interesting that uh, we have this, uh, this kind of uh, dramatic epidemic of chronic long-term disease, and at the same time, we all crave these fatty foods. Or, there's such an accepted part of our culture that it's almost like a joke when people talk about bacon and they talk about fried Twinkies and fried Snickers bars and pizzas. It's all, like all the foods we love to eat are fried fatty foods. So staying away from fried fatty foods, especially processed fats, is that's probably the most important thing you could do for leaky gut. Then there's patching up the gut strategies. Uh, things like anything that helps you build collagen will help patch up the gut. Glycosaminoglycans, these polysaccharides that we've been talking about, like bucoidin, long chains of sugar, uh, like N-acetylglucosamine and glucosamine and hyaluronic acid, they all have a building property for the lining of the intestine. And then Last, but most certainly not least, keeping the environment of the, the hollow of the intestine, the lumen of the intestine is very important. And that's where probiotics come in, as well as fiber that support probiotics, prebiotics. So making sure you're on the nightly essence or the daily digest, which is a great source of probiotics, as well as making sure that you're getting enough fiber to keep the intestine clean. Those are the best things you could do for leaky gut. And then intermittent fasting or calorie reduction are also important for keeping the intestine clean. Intermittent fasting gives your intestine a break so that it can recover and it can heal. Between meals, your intestine heals anyway. Intermittent fasting extends that period between meals and calorie reduction or calorie restriction is the same idea. Uh, it's not a full-blown fast, but it's limiting or reducing the amount of food that your intestine has to deal with. Giving, giving your intestine a break is incredibly valuable and that's why every study that's ever been done on intermittent fasting and fat or fasting in general shows health benefits. You're basically giving your digestive system and specifically your intestine a break. So, uh, and then also, there's also a stomach strategies that can be helpful for the intestine. Food drops into the intestine, obviously from the stomach. So by using digestive enzymes, the ultimate enzymes, for example, acidifying agents like betaine, B-E-T-A-I-N-E, -E, which is found in the ultimate enzymes or using apple cider vinegar with meals, using aloe vera with meals. Those can all have an acidifying effect that helps uh, support the intestine as foods drop into the intestine. And along the same lines, bile, B-I-L-E, bile salts, which are found in the ultimate enzymes can also have a beneficial effect for the, for the intestine. Uh, last sure. one, I should tell you gelatin, like you'll find in the uh, glucogel caps or any kind of gelatin also has a soothing and healing effect on the intestine. Great, yeah, that was it. I don't have it. I just know people that probably do. I, and I was just wondering how the heck didn't, would they know for sure? Because, well, you just said you're always sick. Yes, there's a lactulose, they call it the lactulose mannose test, which is a sugar drink that you'll drink and they'll, they'll compare the amount of lactulose and mannose that you drank to the amount that's excreted. But you really right. don't, you don't want to, you don't, it, it, you want to be official, know officially maybe, but it's not necessary. Work on the gut no matter what. Work, right. You got it, especially if you have a long-term chronic health challenge. Great. Thanks a lot, Ben. And hey, for the zinc stuff, I like these uh, zinc plus immune support. Okay. They're, they're chewables from, you know, Longevity. Nice. I got a couple bottles of them and I take them in my car and I'll sit there and munch on them. <laughs> that reminds right. me, the, the test for zinc deficiency is called the zinc taste test. The zinc taste test is when you eat zinc, when you, there's a special kind of zinc that you could buy called zinc heptahydrate. And when you drink this form of zinc, if it tastes really lousy, you know you have enough zinc in your body. If you can't taste it, <laughs> you don't have zinc. It's called a zinc taste test. Great. 
All right, thanks. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Oh, wow. I did not know about that for the Zinc Taste Fest. Thank you so much for sharing that information, Pharmacist Ben. Um, and next, let's go to Ann, who has her hand up. Ann, go ahead and unmute yourself, dear. Hello. Yeah. Um, my question um, is about the ultimate enzymes. Yes. How do you figure out what the right amount of them is to take? No way to know. Just know by how your body, by how you uh, feel after you eat your food especially if you have digestive problems. If you don't have any digestive problems, you're not going to know whether, you know, two or three or five, but more, usually you want about five or six or seven after meals or with your meals a day. All right. Yeah, I do have digestive issues and, and I know it, yeah, and I know it depends on how much I eat, I eat or what I eat. Like, yeah, for my breakfast, when I have a smoothie, one does me okay, but I, I was just having trouble figuring out how many to go for my lunch and dinner. Really no way to know, but if you have digestive problems, that great, that's great because then you could use your digestive symptoms as a barometer uh, or as an indicator for how, many, how much digestive enzymes to take. Also, I should tell you that if you have, uh, there's, there's something called betaine, as I said earlier, B-E-T-A-I-N-E, betaine in the ultimate enzymes. But you can also boost the power or the effect of the ultimate enzymes by using apple cider vinegar or aloe or something acidifying, something extra acidifying with your meals or orange juice, lemon juice. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a very good question also, Anne. Thank you so much for coming on and asking that. Um, now, Ben, we have another question that's in the comments. And Bruce is wanting to know, is collagen better than quality silicone? quality with silica apples and oranges are apples better than oranges oranges they're better totally different. no they're both different silica is incredibly valuable i i consider silica to be one of probably the most underappreciated of all of the minerals all of the um, nutritional elements it's important for the for the uh, for the building of things important for building bone, important for building connective tissue, important for healing, important for the connective tissue in the scalp for people who are losing their hair. Uh, just incredibly valuable. You don't see it very often in supplements. There's a couple of longevity supplements that have silica for plant-derived minerals will give, give you silica as well. Silica is an element on the periodic table. If you look at the periodic table with all the little squares, you'll find, uh, actually you'll find silicon on there. Silica is a, a form of silicon, um, not silicone, you know, chemistry can get kind of confusing with all the nomenclature. So silicone is a, is a artificial ingredient that contains silicon. Silica is basically sand. Uh, nutritional silica is in the, uh, usually comes in the form of something called orthosilicic acid, and it's an incredibly valuable nutritional supplement for every single part of the body. Uh, collagen, on the other hand, is a protein. Silica is an element. Collagen is a protein. It's a complex molecule. And it is uh, the most important protein in the body. It's the protein for building things. It builds bone. Uh, it, it, and when I say build, silica turns on the production of connective tissue. Collagen is connective tissue. Collagen is a component of connective tissue. And like silica, it's multifunctional because it is an important part of connective tissue building. But collagen does other things as well. Collagen, uh, when you eat collagen, something very interesting happens. The same thing with glucosamine. Glucosamine is also part of connective tissue. When you eat glucosamine, when you eat collagen, when you eat high hyaluronic acid, which are all little pieces of connective tissue, and you put them in your mouth, they go into your digestive system, they go into your intestine, and they go into your blood. And then your blood has all of these little pieces of collagen and high hyaluronic acid and glucosamine floating into it. The uh, cells of the connective tissue will spot these little pieces and it will think you're injured it interprets these little pieces that you've eaten of connective tissue that you've eaten as injury because it says, well, last time I, 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 a, muscle, a, a tendon was torn or a ligament was torn or connective tissue was broken, little pieces of connective tissue were floating around. That initiates the production of the building of new connective tissue. This is how glucosamine works and collagen and hyaluronic acid. This is how they work to turn on the production of connective tissue. They signal injury. The body thinks it's been injured. It interprets these little pieces of nutritional supplements as uh, parts of an injury, and it initiates the production of new connective tissue. So in addition to being uh, re required for building connective tissue, 
Collagen also initiates, ingested collagen, also, and peptides, by the way, collagen peptides too, initiate the production of new collagen. So it's a component of collagen, as well as an initiating factor of collagen, of connective tissue, I should say. Silica is a precipitating agent around which connective tissue precipitates. So they function differently. They're both very, very important. Uh, and I suggest supplementing with uh, supplementing daily with both collagen, collagen peptides, as well as with silica. And you know, I've had people ask me, well, why would you put a filler like silica in there? Well, that's and... a little different. The filler is not orthosilicic acid. That's not nutritional silica. It's a little bit different. However, uh, if depending on the form it's in, it can be broken down to provide silicon. Silica is important because it contains silicon. So it's not that silica uh, itself is doing the worth or orthosilicic acid, it's the silicon. And indeed as a filler, if it can be broken down, I'm not sure what form it's in, but if it can be broken down, you will be getting silicon, S-I-L-I-C-O-N, silicon, not silicone. Got it, awesome. Um, so people remember that whenever somebody asks you, well, why is there silica in the products? You know, you've heard it right from pharmacist Ben. Silica is also a flow agent. And that's why it's used in powders and it's used in tablets sometimes. It helps support the flow of uh, powders or in, uh, uh, or in the manufacturing of tablets. It's, it's added to support, to improve the flow of the active ingredients or the chemicals that are made, used to make the tablets or for that matter, the capsules. So that's why you'll see it in, uh, in some nutritional supplements, even though it's not mentioned as a nutritional ingredient in those supplements. All right, perfect. Let's Becca, go to the next I've hand. A, I'm Becca, sorry. I've got a quick one. Okay, you there? Go ahead, Dr. Judy. Sorry. Um, just, a, just a quick aside. One of the projects I did research on was in bone breaking strength in racehorses because you know, you've probably seen a catastrophic injury of a racehorse breaking its leg or whatever. So in my master's degree at Texas A&M, we worked on a project where we fed uh, zeolites, which are actually sodium aluminum silicates to two-year-old racehorses to look at breaking strength. And in that project, we found that at a certain concentration, we actually reduced soft tissue injuries in those racehorses. It was an FDA study and they actually went on and took that information to work on osteoporosis issues in humans. Now that was in 1993. So I don't know, you know, the direct effects, but the point being, there is a benefit to getting that silicon in there. And of course, as part of the research we had to do, you know, it's the, it's the most common thing in our soil and all this kind of, it's very common. Silicon is very common, but it's very hard to get it to be absorbed and used by the body. Right. So just, just an aside, I mean, there's research out there on all that kind of stuff. So again, Yes, it's in there for a purpose and it does, you know, it is important. Judy, Dr. G's point is very well taken. Silicon is the most abundant, uh, next to oxygen, I think, is the most abundant element in the soil, but um, it's very hard <laughs> to absorb. It's found in all plants. All living, all, living, all living things have silicon in them, but it's hard to get, it's hard to get it into the, di uh, into the bloodstream through the digestive system. That's why orthosilicic acid is so important, which is a form of silica that's uh, easier for the body to absorb. Awesome, thank you so much. You know, I love, love our community, Ben. We have so many knowledgeable people where we're taking all of this brain power and putting it together in, in building the community so that we can be better resources as we're reaching out to others. So um, I just encourage any and all of you that have knowledge um, from, from research that you've done, from schooling that you've done, like Dr. Judy, and then one of our next hands, that is up. Um, don't be afraid to speak out and use your voice, use your knowledge, because you're taking that knowledge and you're taking the knowledge that you're getting now with the supplementation and the importance of it, and you're marrying them together. And think of what an impact you are making on your own health and the health of those around you. I just, ah, it gives me goosebumps. Uh, I'm so excited to be able to share all of these amazing people on this has been, it's just incredible. But let's go to the next hand. 
And Heather, I think Heather's next. Yeah, Heather, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, how are you going, Ben and Becca? Hello, Heather. Hello, Heather, from so far yeah. away. Yeah, from Australia. Um, I, after listening to you, Ben, about all the products that you've mentioned, um, my son is getting married in eight weeks. He's desperate to get rid of um, quite severe facial eczema. Um, I find also his um, environment doesn't help it. He roasts coffee beans and the powder affects it as well. But I've given him some products, but I can't seem to, to um, help him with this. So out of everything you've discussed today, what can I do for him, like real therapeutic to help him in the next eight weeks? Absolutely, great question. There, I, I've been dealing with eczema for many years. You may know I'm in the skin business. I've been studying the skin and working with the skin since 1982, which I can't even believe it. It's almost 40 years. So I know quite a bit about the skin. Um, the skin is really kind of a deceiving organ because it's, I don't, actually, I don't even, I sometimes wonder what people think of when they see the skin if they're not, if they haven't studied the skin because it doesn't, it certainly doesn't look like an organ. Uh, the most important uh, aspect of the skin and the most um, hard to understand aspect of the skin or deceiving aspect of the skin is the fact that it's layered, it has many layers like baklava or like lasagna. And the bottom layers are always moving to the top and how the bottom layers arise to the top requires lots of chemistry. Lots of things have to happen correctly for the bottom to rise up to the top and then be shed off. Eczema is, occurs when that doesn't happen as it should. Eczema is a problem where the barrier, the skin barrier is not formed correctly because of problems with chemistry as the cells are moving upwards from the bottom to the top. There's a couple of key strategies for uh, addressing this. Number one is uh, digestive issues. When toxicity enters into the bloodstream, eventually those toxins will find their way into the skin and that will interfere with how cells or how tissue is rising from the bottom to the top. So looking for food allergies, eliminating problem foods and correcting digestive issues is probably the first thing you want to do for your eczema patient. And it's no accident that eczema and asthma go together. Kids who have eczema tend to have asthma as well. And that's because in a way, uh, uh, asthma is like an a, a, a eczematic condition that's occurring in the respiratory tract. Immune problems in general tend to be higher in patients who have eczema, eczema because of this leaky gut mechanism. So patching up the gut with all the strategies we talked about, uh, gelatin and hyaluronic acid and bone broth, collagen peptides, probiotics, um, uh, fiber, anything you do for the digestive system, of course, eliminating problem foods, noticing when his uh, eczema breakouts occur, keeping uh, doing charting where he charts all the foods he eat, eats and relates them to eczema breakouts. That will give him an indicator of foods that are connected to his breakouts. Also. If he has digestive issues, that's great because that will give him a, an immediate barometer, an immediate uh, connection to the kinds of foods he's eating. Eczema sometimes takes a few days to show up, but if he has bloating or gas or constipation or diarrhea or anything that's a digestive or intestinal problem, connect those up with problem foods and then eliminate those foods. So working on the intestine or this and the digestive tract in general and eliminating problem foods, that's the first thing you want to do. The second thing is fats. As tissue is rising from the bottom to the top, there's a lot of communication that's occurring. The top has to communicate back to the bottom to tell, to tell the bottom what's happening at the top. So for example, if, the, if the, the cells are moving too fast, signals are sent down to the bottom and say, hey, slow down. If, if cells are moving too slow, signals are sent down to the bottom, say, hey, speed things up. This communication between the top and the bottom depends on fats, especially essential fatty acids, and essential fatty acids, your omega, your uh, ultimate essential fatty acids are the most important supplement to take for eczema. Also for psoriasis, which is in a way like reverse eczema. And then also uh, fatty vitamins, especially vitamins A and D are very important for eczema. Uh, vitamin D, of course, you'll, uh, the sun is the best place to get uh, vitamin D. And the sun is well known as a treatment for both eczema and for psoriasis. Uh, and then vitamin A, you'll get vitamin A in a lot of the longevity products. The Immortalium has a bunch of vitamin A, not beta carotene, by the way, real vitamin A. And then uh, the mineral zinc, which we talked about earlier, is also very important for cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication. Uh, and you'll find zinc in a lot of products. So zinc, vitamin A, vitamin D, essential fatty acids, and then correct digestive problems and use digestive health strategies. Nobody should have eczema, number one, which tells you that if you correct the problem at the cause, 
your son never has to have eczema again. It's not something he's condemned to. And the fact that, uh, uh, this, that they give you steroid creams as the main treatment tells you that you're dealing with an immune and inflammatory condition. Uh, eczema is a condition of immunity and inflammation that's caused by damaged cells at the communication level and by immune factors that leak into the blood and find their way into the skin at the digestive system level. Thank you. Um, his chiropractor um, suggested he have a vitamin C infusion. It's not I didn't know how to feel about that. It's not a bad idea. It's always great, but vitamin, that's not going to directly help the eczema. That'll support his immune system. And vitamin C, there's a really cool book by a guy named Thomas Levy, L-E-V-Y, called The Primal Panacea, in which uh, Dr. Levy, who's also an attorney as well as a, a medical doctor, he says that vitamin C is good for everything. He calls it the primal panacea, and I agree with him. So it's not a bad idea to do that, but it's not going to directly affect his eczema. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Heather. Really great question. I know there's a lot of people that are dealing with eczema and psoriasis and, and I love the fact that we have pharmacist Ben here with us who is a skin specialist um, and has been working with the skin for 40 years. Crazy, Almost right? 40 years. Yeah, That's no. crazy. crazy. Since I was like 10. You just don't seem that much older than me. Uh -huh. But anyways. Um, so our, our next hand that is up um, is probably, well, it's not probably, She's not probably, but she is my very favorite retired surgeon. Oh, wow. And Dr. Debbie Martinez, is, she's incredible. And I love the fact that she's on here with us today um, with a question. Oh, I, that was not what I wanted to do. All right. Dr. Debbie, go ahead and unmute. Hi, hey, Dr. Debbie. And Dr. Hi, Debbie, Dr. Judy just waved at you, so just. Thank you, Judy. Yeah. Well, my question is, I have a client who has a bad malperfusion ulcer and had to have it surgically debrided and his foot open. And I wanted to think, uh, listening to your discussion, made me think of, what would you recommend nutritionally for this person? Okay. You've talked about a lot of things. Um, that's, that's my question. Yes, most so he's a diabetic yeah, most, and has that, that problem. Well, the diabetes has to be addressed too. So, you know, everything for supporting circulation and uh, uh, eliminating glycation, which is the sugaring, the sugaring reaction that happens when your blood sugar gets high, that's all really important. Of course, the sweeties and the ultimate niacin and the ultimate selenium are all very important for blood sugar control. Um, but as far as wound healing goes, there's a couple strategies. Most important is protein especially uh, the amino acid arginine, which is incredibly valuable for all wound healing, uh, including for burns, by the way. And there's, a, there's tons of literature on the use of nutritional arginine. Arginine, I call arginine super amino acid because it's got four nitrogens for the chemists out there, which makes it incredibly valuable uh, for healing things and for growing things. So uh, protein in general, uh, high protein foods tend to have arginine in, in them, but you can supplement with straight arginine or also do uh, things like the fit shake, which have arginine in them. Uh, then essential fatty acids are also very important. The ultimate EFAs are very important for wound healing, both omega-6 and omega-3. Omega-3, uh, omega-6 sometimes gets dismissed, but it's really important for the healing process and for wound healing, as is zinc in the, in the zinc FX. In fact, uh, when you burn yourself or cut yourself or have an ulcer, have some kind of trauma on the skin, zinc is actually mobilized to the, to the area where the wound occurs. Zinc is there's more, there's more zinc in the skin than there is in almost any other organ of the body, maybe possibly with the exception of the liver. Uh, and that zinc that's stored in the skin is actually redirected to wounds to accelerate healing. Zinc is involved at, at the genetic level in the growth of tissue. So making sure that your patient has enough zinc as well is important. Uh, and then uh, also vitamin A is very important for wound healing and for the growth of connective tissue. Uh, if it's an ulcer, I'm assuming the connective tissue is damaged as well. And then also all of the things that we talked about earlier for building connective tissue, including collagen, collagen peptides, glucosamine, um, hyaluronic acid, anything that you're going to do for, uh, in fact, here's a great, great strategy for anybody who wants to build connective tissue, whether you're talking about wound healing or you're talking about the digestive tract uh, it, or you're talking about anti-aging for the skin, use arthritis supplements. Anything that helps build connective tissue in the joints 
is going to help build connective tissue when you're dealing with a wound, or it's going to help build connective tissue in the vasculature or in the gut if you're dealing with leaky gut syndrome or a cardiovascular issue, or it's going to help connective tissue in the skin if you want, if you're concerned about wrinkles or thinning skin or any other signs of skin aging, using arthritis supplements in general will help you build connective tissue, will also help you with wound healing. Thank, Thank you. you. Or, uh, doc, I'm sorry, just, I didn't catch your name, Dr. Dr. Debbie Martinez. Dr. Debbie Martinez. Where are you from, Dr. Debbie? Are you in the United States? California. He's in Washington by me. Go what? ahead. Can you unmute, De Dr. Debbie? I'm in trouble doing that. Okay. There yeah. we go. I'm in Spokane, Washington. Washington. I'm in Spokane, Washington. And what kind of surgeon were you? I was a surgical oncologist. Oh. And I dealt primarily with breast cancer. And how long have you been in longevity, doing longevity? About two years. Is she two in our years. downline, Rebecca? Are you in our downline? Yes. Oh, I'd love to get you on the radio program if you get a chance, Dr. Debbie. Will you send love me? Love to do it. Yeah, Rebecca, would you send me Dr. Debbie's email information? Yes. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you, Dr. Debbie. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for today, both of you, you and Becca. Thanks so much. Oh, you're very welcome. And everybody, I mean, I think everybody got something out of today's today's program. I think it's just, I love how things just bounce around. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Um, so much information shared. And something that you had just mentioned, Pharmacist Ben, was in regards to the L-arginine. Now, there, there's some thought that when dealing with um, certain viral infections like shingles, you know, the herpes zoster, yes. um, herpes simplex, her, you know, all these different um, herpes type viruses, that there's a balance between arginine and uh, lysine. That's right. And too much arginine um, can actually stimulate an outbreak. Well, no, it won't stimulate. It's not that it stimulates an out outbreak. It's that the, the viruses feed on arginine. So okay. you have to be, your body has to be weakened. Viruses are opportunistic, meaning the body has to be in a weakened state for a viral infection to take hold. Viral infections will not take hold in a body that's in a strengthened state. So you can take all the arginine you want if your body is strong. However, if you're in a weakened state, yes, that's true. Arginine feeds viruses and viruses can thrive and proliferate under conditions of high arginine and low lysine. And this is why taking lysine supplements have been recommended for folks who are dealing with cold sores. A lot of people will tell you that when they get a, feel like a cold sore is coming, they'll just start cranking out the, argin or the lysine and that will make sure that, that will assure that they don't get a cold sore. That's because the lysine is balancing out the arginine. So if you're strong and healthy, you don't have to worry about it. If you're in a weakened condition, if you're immune compromised on some level, if you're dealing with a lot of stress, yes, that's true. High arginine can feed viruses, viruses feed on arginine and taking lysine can help balance that out. Good to know, good to know. And okay, so and do we have time for one more? Yes. All right, let's go ahead and get Mike back up here. He has an additional question. Uh, Mike, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, Ben, can you hear me? I hear you now, Mike. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, a lot of my clients are like calling me because, you know, New Year's is over. Yeah. Well, I got a great one for you because blood pressure is a nightmare for a lot of people. Uh, now, I got a, one of my clients called me this morning. He's concerned, you know, his blood pressure has been going up. And he asked me if, if too many vitamins and minerals can like raise your blood pressure up. No. That doesn't happen. Okay. There's Secondly, it like his blood pressure today was like 140 over 87. Okay. And it's normally around 120 over 78, he says. A little bit on the high end. Uh, there's yeah. a, high blood pressure is a sign that the tissues are trying to get oxygen. If they're not getting oxygen, it's like a garden hose. When I think we talked about this last time as I'm as I'm saying this, if uh if the blood the, the blood vessels could be thought of like a hose, they're delivering blood. If the blood pressure is high, that's a sign that the body is saying, hey, we need to get more blood. We're not getting enough blood to the area, which is kind of ironic because antihypertensives slow, they open up the blood vessels, which slows down or reduces the blood pressure and decreases the amount of blood that's getting into, into the blood vessels. So antihypertensives actually are counterproductive to the body's health, even though they lower the blood pressure. 
What you want to do is you want to figure out why is the body feeling like it needs to get more blood to the air, to the various tissues. And usually that has to do with stress and high blood pressure is usually a sign of the stress response. And for anybody who, you know, I'm sure most people here can understand that, but if you have friends or like you're talking about your friend who doesn't believe that, just tell them to go sit in a warm bath, take their blood pressure before they take a bath and then go sit in a warm bath and then notice what happens to their blood pressure. It will drop like a stone guaranteed. Just simply sitting in a bath. In fact, you may notice, or some of you guys may notice, that if you stand up quickly out of when you get out of a bath, out of a warm bath or hot bath, you notice you feel a little dizzy or woozy. That's because you're not getting enough blood perfusion because your blood pressure has dropped while you're sitting in the blood, while you're sitting in the bath. So sitting in the bath is a great way to lower your blood pressure quickly. In five no. minutes, you lower your blood pressure without any drugs. In fact, if you're on drugs, you'll notice that your blood pressure drops too fast. That's why they'll tell you if you're on antihypertensive not to, use, not to get in a hot tub or to be careful if you're in a hot tub. Another thing you can do is slow deep breathing because oxygenation is really what the blood is trying to accomplish with, with, the, or with the circulatory system is trying to accomplish with the high blood pressure. It's trying to deliver oxygen to the tissues. By breathing, by practicing slow deep breathing, making sure you're oxygenating correctly and blowing off carbon dioxide, uh, that's another strategy for opening up the blood vessels, slow deep breathing techniques. Any relaxation strategy will do it. There's also wonderful nutritional supplements that will lower the blood pressure. Magnesium is an antihypertensive. In fact, magnesium is nature's own calcium channel blocker. It balances out calcium. Calcium has a hypertensive effect. Magnesium is an antihypertensive effect. Niacin, the ultimate niacin is a great antihypertensive. The ultimate niacin will also lower blood cholesterol. It's also great for lowering blood sugar. A niacin is unbelievably valuable nutritional supplement. And it's also a natural antihypertensive and omega fats, your ultimate EFAs are natural antihypertensive as well, as well, particularly omega-3 fatty acids. So between relaxation strategies, psychological relaxation strategies like meditation, physiologic relaxation strategies like breathing and sitting in warm water, magnesium, niacin, omega fatty acids, you could go a long way towards lowering blood pressure without having to resort to antihypertensives, which are known in the world of pharmacy as being among the most toxic of all prescription drugs. And my last question. Yes. Can he go for like a, a, a long walk or exercise if his blood pressure is a little high? Would absolutely. that cause absolutely. any? No. Absolutely. So he could go ahead and exercise even absolutely. if his blood pressure is a little absolutely. high. Yeah. Make sure he's supplementing, doing all the other strategies as well. Uh, but absolutely, you can you can exercise. In fact, exercise is one of the a great way to help lower blood pressure by strengthening the heart. Good. It's funny you said that because I just put him. He's on the ninety, and I just I just got him. Put him on the magnesium and the zinc, and the ultimate classic tablets. Ultimate, ultimate niacin. classic. Also the huh? ultimate niacin. And the oh, yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you, right. Rebecca. Thanks, All Rebecca. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one more question Debbie had. She wants to know, would zinc help with canker sores? Yes, absolutely. Zinc is great for canker sores. So is vitamin C. Zinc is important for all. Uh, the, the skin is part of the body, uh, uh, one of the uh, part of the body called epithelia, E-P-I-T-H-E-L-I-A. Epithelia is your coating, the covering. The skin is epithelia. The covering of your eyes is epithelia. The coverings on all your organs is epithelia. Uh, zinc is a very important epithelial regenerating mineral. So anywhere we have canker sores or wounds or cuts or scrapes or any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, broken tissue inside the body, like in the intestinal tract, uh, think, think zinc, zinc for healing. So yes, for canker sores. Okay, and one more. So Ardine has a question. She says, um, phytic acid is high in nuts, seeds, and grains. How do you eliminate? Well, phytic acid is not is, is good for you. Phytic acid, when it's taken with minerals and other nutrients, can complex with those minerals and other nutrients and keep them uh, keep your body from absorbing them. And that's the problem with phytic acid. That being said, phytic acid is a wonderfully valuable nutritional nutritional substance. So you don't want to eliminate phytic acid. What you want to do is you want to avoid using phytic acid with your other nutritional supplements. But phytic acid is a valuable nutritional nutritional substance. It's just that it magnetically attracts minerals and it will keep your minerals from being absorbed. And so you wanna just make sure you're taking your minerals apart from your phytates or your phytic acid. But I wouldn't think, I wouldn't worry about eliminating phytic acid from your diet. 
All right, thank you so much. Um, a great hour and a half. I know there were quite a few um, questions and comments that this has been a great, great show. Um, oh, Tanya wants to know, would Vin answer about vitamin D toxicity versus deficiency? What to watch oh, for awesome. and whether it's a concern? No, it's not a concern. It's almost impossible unless you, unless you get crazy and swallow a half a bottle or a whole bottle of vitamin D pills. Your body, vitamin D is so powerful that your body has to activate it for it to be active. It's not active on its own. The vitamin D we take orally uh, or in foods is not activated. It's not, doesn't do work until it's activated by the kidneys and by the liver. And the reason that's so is because vitamin D is so powerful. So it's very difficult. You have to really overwhelm the system to, to uh, suffer from vitamin D toxicity. That being said, the best way to get your vitamin D is from the sun because the vitamin D you get from the sun is activated by skin cells and then released slowly into the body as needed. And that's the way we're supposed to get vitamin D. Other than that, vitamin D from foods and vitamin D from supplements, of course, are ways to, or sources of vitamin D. Uh, but you don't have to worry about overdosing on it because your body will activate vitamin D and won't activate vitamin D if, you, if you've got too much, if, if there's too much that's coming in through the diet. Um, you could, you know, you can, you can go crazy, I suppose, and swallow a bottle of vitamin D capsules and then you might run into a problem. But under ordinary circumstances, it's, it's really difficult to suffer from vitamin D toxicity. Vitamin D deficiency, however, is a very real thing. Uh, it has to do with our lack of exposure to the sun, digestive problems, uh, intest specifically intestinal problems, not eating enough vitamin D containing foods, uh, which are, tend to be the foods that we're told not to eat. Organ meats, dairy, um, fatty fish. These are foods that are very high in vitamin D. Uh, and then also if you're not supplementing with vitamin D. So make sure you're getting out in the sun is, pro in my opinion, that's the best way to get your vitamin D. And I have a question about that. Yes. So the windows are going to have this UV protection. Yes. Does that limit yes. or reduce yes. the vitamin D? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If you have protective windows, tinted windows, that kind of thing, you're not going to get as much vitamin D. And when you talk about getting vitamin D from the sun, I'm really talking about exposing all of your skin to the sun, not just your elbows and not just your face or your arms, but really exposing as much of your skin as possible. And that's that's really what's important. Not only that, but if you are laying out in the sun, these, you know, it's winter time now, probably a lot of people aren't laying out in the sun, but if you are laying out in the sun, don't jump in the shower because the vitamin D is produced in the liquids that are secreted out of your skin. So if you rinse yourself off, you jump in the pool or you take a shower, you're not going to get as much benefit, vitamin D producing benefit from the sun as if you just lay there and allow those secretions to sit on your skin. Good to know. Good to know. Well, Ben, Thank you so much you for so another much. awesome Q&A with pharmacist Ben and myself and Dr. Judy Reynolds. Thank you so much for your input. Um, I just, I, like I said, I love the fact that we have so many great minds um, as part of our community where we're able to really be a, a strong, vital resource um, for, for others in and I want to thank Jaunty for being a co-host and Lance, thank you so much for co-hosting and letting people in as we're going. Those of you who are already with Longevity, you know, I, we love you as part of our family, part of our community. And if you are here as a guest, make sure that you get back with the person that invited you to this program and let them know what you thought of about the program, what you liked best, what you learned um, that you didn't know before, and just really start asking that person that shared this program with you questions about what you can do to create yourself a better health journey. And we do have a business opportunity here, as you probably picked up on some of the talk, that is absolutely incredible. I love the fact that I have been able to create a career with purpose. And that purpose is to build stronger communities, stronger bodies, and let people be empowered of their own health, but also their own financial future. Um, so, so ask questions. And if you found this program 
um, by one of our emails being a newsletter, you've never spoken to anybody about longevity before, you can go to the criticalhealthnews.com website, use the contact us, or even do a, a reply to the newsletter that you received, contact us and we will get back with you and get your questions answered. So again, thank you so much, Pharmacist Ben Fuchs. Thank you. You're Rebecca. amazing. Thank you, Lance and everybody. Nice to see yep. you. See you month. Ben. Bye, everybody. All right, right everybody. We will see you next month also. So we're going to try to do this program once a month. Um, we're shooting for the second or the third Saturday of every month. So make sure you stay tuned. Dante, anything that you would like to add before we say goodbye? Have a wonderful week. No, not really. Uh, cheers, everyone. Great to see you all. <laughs> cheers, everyone. And hey, happy new year. Bye for now. <laughs>